Ah, oh, but that's excellent. But wait, didn't he say that you'd been wanting to go to England? As you wish. Cat I can understand for some reason. Okay, Zoe, I got those treats you like from across town. Though I don't know why I needed to go right now to get them. But, oh, you two started the show already. Cool. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm not, um, not upset. I'm just going to continue the story and let you both figure out whatever this is. Henry V is a serious contender for the most impressive man ever to rule England. In the words of a famous historian, Henry had, by the end of his reign, transformed the spirit of his own people and become the arbiter of Christian Europe, dwarfing emperor and pope. Contemporaries agreed. On his death, a chronicler wrote, he did not leave his like upon earth among Christian kings or princes. Henry V was fiercely intelligent, focused, a brilliant military commander and strategist, frighteningly dynamic and energetic. His only fault was to die young. Well, that and being so horrifically ruthless and cold that another historian wrote of Henry that he was conclusive proof that a man may be a hero and yet a monster. Henry became king in 1413. He was fiercely pious and heard mass several times a day. He was also a ruthless advocate of religious unity. His father, the usurper Henry IV, had passed a law called De Heretico Comberendo, which means literally, heretics shall be burned. Henry V was equally determined to rub out any heresy, and in 1417 he would execute even his companion in arms, John Oldcastle, as a result. For medieval monarchs, the unity of the church was a divinely ordained responsibility, but it was also good politics. The church was far and away the most effective propaganda and communication device any medieval ruler could hope for. In the first two years of his reign, Henry made quite clear who was boss. He had a talent of creating a sense of collaboration, consultation and purpose amongst his great men, while being utterly ruthless with anyone who stepped out of line. Thus, as his army waited to sail for France in 1415, his very last act was to execute a man of royal blood, a grandson of the great Edward III for trumped-up reasons of treason. Henry V always intended to make war on France. As far as he was concerned, he had been cheated of his birthright, as established by the Treaty of Bretigny in 1360. And if the French wouldn't give it to him, he would take it from them. So there. The French, meanwhile, had recovered their effortless arrogance, and in so many words, they informed Henry that his mother was a hamster and his father smelt of elderberries. Henry would show them they'd chosen the wrong guy to call the son of a hamster. In 1415, Henry appealed to English patriotism by repeating Edward III's charge that the French were trying to eradicate the English language. From now on, Henry made sure English was the official language of England. He even wrote open letters to his people in English. Of course, he backed that up by contracting 320 captains and from the towns and villages all over England, archers and knights set out for Southampton to join their king. And in August 1415, an army of 12,000 left England. Henry tried one last letter to the Dauphin of France. It read, Friend, give us what we are owed, and by the will of the Almighty avoid a deluge of human blood. Not sure he was serious about the friend thing. In France, the mad King Charles VI was about as useful as a chocolate teapot, but despite the squabbling of the royal dukes, the Dauphin managed to pull together a united front. And when Henry landed at the walls of Harfleur, he was in a dangerous position, exposed and vulnerable. At Rouen, just 50 miles away, the French army gathered. Capturing a base quickly was essential, but Harfleur fought heroically and it was six long weeks before it finally agreed to yield. Harfleur's stubborn resistance gave Henry a further problem. It was now almost October. Medieval armies went home for winter. Supplying an army of any size through winter was practically impossible. But to go home after capturing one poxy castle was not in the playbook for either hero or monster, obviously. Marching all the way through French territory to Calais just to show the French that he could would be utterly daft. So that is of course what Henry decided to do. Just to make the message absolutely clear, he'd follow the route of Edward III and cross the river Somme at Blanche Tac. As they marched north, the English army left a brown trail of poo behind them. Dysentery, the biggest killer of medieval warfare. Camp fever, as it was called, and Henry's army had it in spades from the camps around Harfleur. They were weak, riven by illness, and really in no condition to fight. And so Henry played it safe, and he took a route to stay away from the Dauphin's army, gathering at Rouen. Sadly, the French were not blithering idiots and had learned from last time. They'd closed the ford at Blanche Tac. Once again, though, the English managed to find a way to cross the River Somme, but this time the French were already ahead of them. Near the village of Agincourt, as the English crested a rise, they were faced by the terrifying sight of the French just waiting for them. 
The disease-ridden English army was probably down to about 8,000 now, 6,500 of whom were lightly armed archers. Facing them was something like 15,000 heavily armed Frenchmen. Again, the French had learned the lesson of Cressy, and this time they waited overnight. The sound of their partying drifted over to the camp of the cold, wet and sick English. The following day, the French did not just charge, they waited. And so both armies waited as the rain poured down, soaking earth, clothes, bodies, staring at each other across a ploughed field. The French had a plan, and it did not include charging at the English to be mown down by arrows. The English had a plan. It involved the French charging at them and being mown down by arrows. Stalemate. Henry had to provoke a response. Mounted on a white horse, he gave the signal. English trumpets blared. Now strike, came the order. With the flash of a white baton, the whole army advanced to longbow range and unleashed a storm. Satisfyingly, the French panicked, forgot their plan and attacked. The story is well known. The French attacked the English line over the mud of a ploughed field. As they came on, they were hammered by archers. When they arrived, they could barely stand in the mud, let alone fight, and they were hacked down. Henry would let nothing stand in the way of victory. Without Ruth, he sent a body of 200 English archers to slaughter all the helpless French prisoners in the English camp to show the French that Henry would stop at nothing to achieve victory. The French got the message and they fled. The great men of France lay dead in the mud and blood or were captured. That night, as Henry celebrated at supper, the Dukes of Orléans and Bourbon were made to serve him. It was the ultimate humiliation. Great victory though it was, Agincourt was the opening of a war, not the end of it. In 1417, Henry was back with a new army, this time going city to city to make himself King of France. And city by city, northern France began to fall to his talent. At last, in 1418, after a six-month siege, he captured the mighty Rouen, capital of Normandy, 70,000 people strong, half as big again as London. Against him, the French were now led by John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy. By now, the Duke was almost richer and more powerful than the French monarchy itself. His court had become Europe's cultural centre, famed throughout Christendom. This made it difficult for the Dauphin to like or trust the Duke. No heir to the French throne likes to have a subject more powerful than he was, who might just take a shine to his throne. No Duke likes to feel that his monarch is jealous enough to cut his throat. This made conversations a little awkward, but they eventually agreed to meet on neutral ground, on a bridge between their two camps. The security arrangements were elaborate, and as it happens, rubbish. Because on the 10th of September 1418 on the bridge, Duke John the Fearless was hacked to death by the Dauphin's men. This was an act of breathtaking brutality and buttock-clenching stupidity. So buttock-clenchingly stupid, in fact, that when a hundred years later the French King Francis I visited the friary where the skull of John the Fearless was held, he remarked, Here is the hole through which the English entered France. John the Fearless' son was understandably miffed that his dad had been hacked to death and there was only one man capable of wreaking the vengeance he thirsted for, Henry. So England and Burgundy agreed to replace the Valois dynasty with the Plantagenet dynasty as kings of France in the form of Henry V. The Anglo-Burgundian alliance was irresistible. England's steamroller controlled vast swathes of northern France, Normandy, Maine, Touraine, Anjou and even Paris itself. The Dauphin was a washed-up has-been loser on the run. By 1420, the mentally ill Charles VI was forced to agree to an astounding Treaty of Troyes. By this treaty, Henry would be married to the king's daughter Catherine of Valois. Their children would be the heirs to the throne of France. In 1420, Henry and Catherine tied the knot. In December 1421, Catherine gave birth to their son, who would therefore be king of France. But while Henry had no military equal, camp fever was a challenge too far for him. And as he campaigned, dysentery caught up with him and on August the 31st, 1422, he died. But he died only after having conferred with his brother, John, Duke of Bedford, about what should happen next. Which was a good thing, because the new King of England was nine months old and a good deal more interested in filling his nappies than ruling his new kingdoms. <laughs>